What is up, Nets fans? Welcome to the Brooklyn Buzz. I'm your host, Nick Faye. With me, as always, Jack Manuel. What's up, Jack? Joe Harris on a podcast. It's just, it's, it's good. It's all good. Yes, I can tell you're going to be excited for this one. We're covering Joe Harris, Damari Carroll, Ed Davis, season reviews. If you haven't saw it already, we've already done a couple. Karis LeVert, D'Angelo Russell, Jared Allen, Spencer Dinwiddie. Be sure to check it out. iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, OTGBasketball.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. But Jack... Let's get right into Joe Harris, who had a career year, won the three-point contest, top three-point shooter in the NBA in terms of percentage. How happy were you with his season? Oh, I mean, you, if you're anything but ecstatic with the different Joe Harris, uh, then you're not doing things right. You're not living life right. Um, he was awesome. Um, obviously, he, he his postseason left a little bit to be desired, but shooting over 47% from three, over 82% from the line, uh, an effective field goal percentage of nearly 63%. Um, he was scoring incredibly well, incredibly efficiently. Um, his skill set, he was passing pretty well. Um, he was strong. Um, he was just, he was the the embodiment of the rise of the Brooklyn Nets. And, you know, he got a lot of credit as as was well-deserved. He beat, you know, Stephen Curry and, and Seth Curry in the hometown of Charlotte. And, you know, it's the, people started putting respect on his name and the, the Rondé Hollis Jefferson Fahrenheit video was really <laughs> nice. It was just a wonderful season for Joe. And um, he's living it up in Spain with my boy d now. So he's enjoying it. Yeah, it really was. I mean, and you said, you know, he's the embodiment of the Nets organization and coming from where he was, you know, maybe not even an NBA player to being one of the best three-point shooters in the league and just a perfect role player because he's a guy that just does so many things that you need on a winning team. Saw that this year with Joe. And like you said, a three-point contest, getting that W I thought was really cool for him and just something he'll look at, look back to the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously something that you know the the great three point shooters have done. You know, Stephen Curry, or Larry Bird, all these sort of you know really great three point shooters in the history of the game have won the contest. And, you know, Joe Harris put a lot of work in it. There was uh, some behind the scenes videos at the Brooklyn Nets as well. Um, he's just an incredibly efficient guy. And um, Shaggy Joe, Beef Shaggy Joe, Joey Hoops, <laughs> my my love, whatever you want to call him, he was just absolutely insane. Um, and, you know, it was just an unexpected performance because he started things off and he just set the standard. And everyone's like, oh, okay, well, this is, this is a, you know, the three-point contest uh, for a lot of people was the, the highlight of the weekend, and it certainly was for me. Yeah, and you mentioned it. It's like Joe started off really hot, and then, like, a lot of people expect him to get back to, like, you know, his averages of last year, but he maintained and carried on throughout the season. I thought that was really impressive. But, Jack, before you move on, really important question. What was your favorite Joe Harris nickname? Oh, um, oh, Beef Jerky Joe is pretty good. Um, yeah. I, I like, I'm just a fan of Joey Buckets. Yeah. I like the simplicity um, and, you know, my boy gets buckets. Yeah, <laughs> it's a smooth one. Probably the, definitely the worst one we've heard on Yes Network was Joe Dirt. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, you don't want to be associated with David Spader, you know, <laughs> mid-2000s film. And, you know, I hear it's a good film, but, um, you know, David Spader has done the, does have the best of reps in Hollywood in terms of his acting uh, prowess. Yes. But, Jack, favorite moment of Joe Harris' season? I mean, there's a lot, Nick. Um, Don't say every game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, looking at some, he, he had some performances where he posted, you know, over 20 points. Um, and, you know, his he sh shooting always was, you know, incredibly consistent. Did have, like, massive outings, but uh, I, I think it probably was a three-point um, three win at All-Star Weekend. Uh, it just seemed to be a really symbiotic moment and, and, and a real sort of make your mark moment. And then, you know, almost like, you know, beyond that, you know, Joe Harris had some moments where he was down in his three-point shooting because other teams started giving him a little more credit. You know, uh, those scouting reports certainly must have increased for him. Um, but, you know, from the post slump, I, I think that it's hard to sort of single out, obviously, other sort of singular moments other than the All-Star Weekend because he had such a consistent and steady season um, that, you know, there were just lots of scoring outbursts where he would like five threes in a quarter or four threes in a quarter. And it's just like, okay, well then this is what we need to get the offense going. Let's just feed Joe. Um, and obviously a lot of the time, you know, he, he wouldn't force the issue either. It was just like he hit one and then he just kept hitting them. Um, and there were just countless nights against, uh, in, in that sort of regard, you know, whether it was against the Cavs, whether it was against the Hornets, whether it was against, you know, the Warriors, he was pretty good as well. Um, uh, was it the Warriors where he had that block on Draymond? Yeah, that was. So um, I think that Warriors game w w was pretty uh, memorable. But yeah, a lot of memorable moments for my boy, Joey. I think, uh, you, like you said, three-point contest is definitely the biggest one because it got him the general NBA buzz. But I believe against the Hornets, he had pretty much a game-sealing layup 
or game tying layup. And that was really big. And that's a big clutch moment. And then also Joe Harris had a lot of clutch threes in the fourth quarter this year. It wasn't like he was just hitting in one, two and three. He had a couple moments in the fourth quarter, especially where he wasn't hitting all game and he just picked it up when the Nets needed it the most. Yeah. And it was odd, you know, most of the time, you know, you look to, to guys like, you know, D'Angelo Russell, Carlos Vert, and those sort of instances. But, you know, when you want a timely bucket, you want to, you want to sort of cool head, you, you know, you go to Joe Harris and, you know, I think in that Hornets game, just looking at, you know, some of his top games of the season, you know, he made two game tying three pointers in the final 90 seconds and he had five of eight from three. So, um, as well as that sort of, you know, layup that you were talking about, he's just, um, he had plenty of those moments this season. And, and for a guy who, you know, was uh, not even in the league two or three years ago, who is now, you know, a starter on a playoff team and obviously didn't have the best playoffs, but, um, you know, certainly I reckon we'll pick it up next season when he's back there again. But uh, a tremendous story and, you know, a, a tremendous story just from him individually, not just the team. Yeah, for sure. But Jack, what's the ideal lineup for Joe Harris to be the best Joe Harris? Yeah, I think uh, you need you know, a floor general out there. Um, you need you need your D'Angelo Russell, you need your Kyrie Irving, then you need whoever. <laughs> um, you need a fellow shooter. I, I feel like he works well when there's an, you know, from um, you know past history, you know, an Alan Crabb out there. Um, I, I think that it's just the extra space that it gives him and the more open shots. Um, Joe Harris doesn't necessarily like to force the contested shots, despite the fact that you know some of the coaches will obviously want him to occasionally put up bad shots. You know, your JJ Reddicks, your Marco Bellinelli, these sort of guys, sharp shooters will take those bad shots, but Joe will almost give them off or you know take the sort of drive and, and drive it into the lane rather than taking those contested shots. Um, a capable wing with a, a bit more sort of defensive acumen than he has. You know, a guy with a bit of size about him. I don't think that that's a guy that we have right now. Um, but, you know, throughout the season, whether that was like, you know, a Rodion, a Karras, a, a Damari Carroll. And then, obviously, you know, you've got your big man who, you know, Joe's pretty pretty adept with sort of playing down low when he has those drives that sort of dump off passes to, to Jared Allen this season were pretty good. So I'll probably chuck in a, a guy like Jared Allen. But he did have some really good chemistry with Ed Davis too. So um, Joe, when he's driving, does have, you know, um, some intelligence passing to those bigs. Yeah, no, I agree, Jack. I think you pretty much nailed it. You know, you're looking, obviously, for someone to make plays out there. And then you're looking for another shooter. Is it Alan Crabb or at least somebody who shoots close to 40%? Because shooters want spacing, too. It's going to make them harder to cover, especially if they're running off ball. And then you want someone in the paint that can kind of be a presence to kind of give you some spacing inside as well. So, And then, you know, the last guy, like you mentioned, ideally would be someone who can cut to the rim, knock down a three, but play good defense and has a little bit more size than Joe. Maybe yeah. Maybe someone that's pick up this summer. Yeah, and I think that there, that it's likely to be a guy we pick up, or it's a guy that just develops a little bit more. Um, oh, I think a lot of teams are going to change in this free agency with, with that many people in the market, and um, it'll be interesting to see. You know, Joe's obviously locked in for a little bit longer. You know, obviously he could be using some sort of trade as well. Um, but uh, with him right now, I think he's an important part, and uh, I think he'd be an important part to any team. He he were to line up in in twenty nineteen twenty. Yeah, you can see the role for Joe Harris on a championship winning team. Is it, you know, the fifth starter or is it the sixth or seventh guy off the bench, whatever it may be at the price he's at, which is around, I believe, seven to eight million dollars a season. I think you look at him and he's a really good piece to have on a roster. But moving on from there, Jack, what would you say were the areas that Joe improved the most this year? Yeah, obviously, um, I think the main one was just driving off the catch. Um, you know, mm -hmm. he, he just had that real purpose and aggression. And, you know, he just obviously was something he talked about that, you know, he, he trained specific things. He didn't train things that, you know, were outside of his comfort zone or outside of what was asked of him. So uh, driving off the catch, driving to the layup, um, you know, sort of finishing as well, finishing around the rim. I thought he was really good, um, you know, just knowing the angles, you know, going under the rim and, you know, finishing with the spin, um, you know, with a little bit of arc on the ball. Obviously, three point catching off the catch um, and then the screen as well, you know, off ball screens or, or him just, you know, finishing and then getting himself set. Um, finishing through contact as well. Um, I think that when he was up around that rim, I mean, he was the biggest leap and he was not the most athletic guy in the world, but he has strength. He just knows how to, you know, finish strong. Um, and, you know, via cleaning the glass, um, he was in the 98th percentile on points per shot. So he, he finished per 100 shot attempts. He had 130 points, um, which is pretty insane. Obviously, just the efficiency that he plays with. And then I think his passing in the paint was pretty good as well in terms of uh, a thing that we probably wouldn't have expected of him, you know, heading into this season either. Yeah, no, you made a lot of great points. I think uh, the one area that you mentioned that is something he does really well 
is his ability to anticipate contact in the paint and then finish after that. A lot of players on the nets, you know, they'll get that contact, they'll fall down, they won't be able to finish their shot. But Joe Harris, like you mentioned, a guy who's not an amazing leaper, is able to kind of take that contact and still finish inside. Then obviously, you know, all the off-ball stuff was impressive. Improvement in the passing area down low, you know, throwing a couple bounces. Another area that you mentioned, too, that he does really well is he protects the ball with his body. He puts the defender in a weird position to block his shot. It has to be someone very smart or someone with, like, elite athleticism that really have a shot at it. And then I think, obviously, we got to talk about the three-point percentage. Making a jump from 41% to 47% is a pretty big jump for an NBA player. Oh, it's insane. It's 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 a massive, massive rise. And, you know, a lot of credit goes to Joe just to – he was getting in and you know you just look at the work that he's he's put in and you know it just shows that when you put in like, rewarded and, and and then some and you know there were nights obviously where he was up and down but um I, I think when you have that sort of base behind you um and i think when it comes to three-point shooting where repetition and you know muscle memory is incredibly important um and i think for for a guy like joe harris who seems to be just a creature of habit and likes his routines um, likes to know where he's going to be shots uh, and those sort of things. You know, he, he, you can sort of expect uh, a level of base and a level of consistency from him. Yeah, I agree. But Jack, what would be some areas that Joe needs to improve on this summer? Yeah, I think that there was there wasn't like necessarily a heap because obviously just given what is asked of him in general, but um, he could be prone to turnovers a, a little bit too much occasionally. Um, whether they be live ball turnovers as well, those sort of passes that we talked about in terms of in the paint, those bounce passes, occasionally you can get a little sloppy with the ball and, and a little bit careless um, for a guy who obviously doesn't have the ball in his hands a lot. Um, I, I think it's getting a shot off the dribble a little bit more. Literally, you know. The majority, the overwhelming majority of his three-point field goals, you know, were off zero dribbles and and one dribble um, had like six point eight percent, forty three point six percent were of zero dribbles, and then you know two dribbles or more, it was barely a percentage point. So um, uh, it's not necessarily something uh, that you want him to sort of you know be able to create his own shot. And he doesn't have the, obviously the tightest hand on the league, um, but just to be able to have that sort of confidence because we know in, when he's got that, he's going to drive off essentially one dribble. The hands of Russell comes to third, um, but tightening up that handle could benefit you know any player in the league, especially a guy like Joe, who uh, I think finishing off the dribble is, is is something that you know can benefit every three point shooter. Yeah, I think it would just be kind of even just a couple dribbles to a mid range jump shot, something you see JJ Redick do a lot because he gets crowded at the three point line, and Kyle Korver, you've seen it from him a little bit too. So almost like an in between shot because he's so good at shooting threes, he's so good at finishing inside. Defenses obviously are picking up on that. This is an area where he can kind of attack. And like you mentioned, handles could get a little bit better. I don't think they ever really have to be elite, just enough to kind of protect the ball passing. Just he tries to do too much sometimes, and some of that is just the Nets roster injuries they had during the season. And I think he could probably get a slight bit better defensively. Obviously, he has his you know physical limit limitations. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's obviously big. He's strong. He's never going to be incredibly athletic, um, and he's smart. Um, I think that you know you can improve so much, and I think that his mentality and effort is 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 what you want more than anything. And obviously, you can only get so much better. He still has, you know, some ways to go in terms of you know, defensive intelligence and switches and, and those sort of things. You know, occasionally in the zone, he would get caught out a little bit occasionally. Um, there's always room for improvement for any player, and, and Joe inclu Joe's included in that. Yeah, and I think maybe, you know, since he might not have the necessary physical tools, maybe, you know, take a couple more charges or something like that. Obviously, it's always a lot to ask of a player to kind of sacrifice their body, but that'd be an area where he could have an impact. But, Jack, where would you say that he ranks at his position? Yeah, it's a tough one because obviously he's a you know pure shooting guard and um, he's not like in the realm of you know Bradley Beal, Clay Thompson, um, these sort of you know CJ McCollum, these elite elite point uh, shooting guards. But you know he's in the JJ Redick. You know obviously he's a lot better than Kyle Korver is these days. JJ Redick is incredibly important for the Sixers, um, but he's one of the best shooting pure shooting guards in the NBA. Um, you know, when you have the best three-point shooting percentage, you know, you look at guys like Danny Green, you know, they're, they're incredibly important to today's day and age. Um, in, in terms of overall, I'd say he's probably, you know, knocking on the top half, uh, maybe fringe top 10 shooting guard, probably a little bit higher. I'm obviously a, a bit higher <laughs> on him than most people, but I, I'd say he's a top half sort of shooting guard in, in today's league. But in terms of shooting and an individual skill set, if we're talking about individual skills, you know, as a pure shooter, he's you know one of the best. 
Yeah, I think as a shooter, he's definitely one of, you know, obviously the numbers back that up, one of the best three-point shooters in the league. Uh, in terms of his position, you know, probably between like 20 and 30 because he does have his deficiencies. He could probably pop into up to 15, maybe, depending on what you're making the case of. But obviously his role is to be a shooter and to be a role guy. It's not like he's expected to become some type of all-star. Yeah, and he, funnily enough, you know, tied with D'Angelo Russell for the most minutes for the Brooklyn Nets. You know, a lot was asked of him, despite the fact that he is, you know, from his skill set and everything that he does, you know, a glorified role player. Um, but just given how important he is to this Nets system offensively, uh, especially in terms of, the, you know, our perimeter sort of um, emphasis, you know, he's incredibly important. And obviously, I don't think he would you know, lead in any other team in minutes um, in the league. But obviously, it was only just a touch over 30 minutes. But um, I think that, you know, he'd be playing 30 minutes on, on a lot of other teams too. But the fact that he led, that he tied for leading the team in minutes um, shows how important and, and how good he was for the Nets this season too. And I think a lot of it has to do with his consistency. You mentioned earlier, even when his shot wasn't falling, he was still having a positive impact on the team. And a lot of guys on the team, that wasn't necessarily necessarily the case. So obviously you give Joe a lot of credit for always working hard on off ball, defense, whatever it may be. But Jack, this is kind of an off topic question. How much would Joe benefit if the Nets were able to land, you know, a Kevin Durant or Anthony Davis or some type of star that kind of drew more gravity towards them? Yeah, I mean, you look at a guy like Clay Thompson, Nick, that sort of immediately springs to mind, and you sort of think about the role that he plays on one of the greatest teams of all time as a third or fourth option, um, and he just sort of is finishing plays, isn't necessarily creating off the dribble a heap, despite the fact that he has the skill set and, and talent to do so, and, you know, he's just getting these open looks, um, you know, he, it sort of allows him to play a, a little more of a defensive role, obviously he's one of the best defensive guards and, and de the perimeter defenders in the league as well. Um, so I think that you you look to that sort of mold where you just add extra talent. You know, it forces, you know, the the other, the opposition to guard those better players. And then but by virtue of just the, the amount of talent you have on your team, it leaves a guy, you know, that is third, fourth in the pecking order with better, more open shots. You know, you have, you know, D'Angelo Russell, Kevin Durant, D'Angelo Russell, Kyrie Irving. That's, those are your two sort of what guys that you're going to probably be, you know, scouting for and focusing on a heap. And then, you know, you just find all these open lanes and open shots for a guy like Joe Harris. It certainly helps. Um, so I think that, you know, adding any talent in the offseason um, that is just, you know, a bit more capable, a bit more sort of, you know, superstar A-level, then it, it's going to help Joe Harris tremendously. Because I think more than anything, you know, it, it helps those shoes because it just gives them that extra bit of space that, you know, Joe Harris probably didn't have a heap of, especially towards the end of the season because teams were really, you know, putting their uh, heap of emphasis on him, putting some of their best defenders on him because they know how important he was to the Nets offensive scheme. Yeah, no, 100% spot on, Jack. Just better players will give you more spacing. And even if they don't get a star, it could just be having a stretch forward that just opens up the floor a little bit more. Like you mentioned, in the playoffs, he wasn't getting much of a step. So any type of space will benefit him. But anything else you want to mention on Joe before we move on? Uh, I mean, um, it's going to be fascinating to sort of see. Obviously, the Nets have him tied up for a, a pretty nice deal for one more season with the, the $8 million per, per year. Very much deserved, very much under market, um, despite what anyone else says. And uh, <laughs> just, a, just a nice sort of package to have, you know, him and Spencer Dinwiddie. To get guys on, you know, cost-friendly deals um, and Joe, two very incredibly important guys, probably two of the most important guys to this Nets roster uh, going forward. Um, and they're not, you know, at a, they're at a really nice age profile as well. Joe Harris is in... You know, in his late twenties or early thirties, you know, he's mid he's mid twenties still. Um, so I think that he's gonna have a role to play on the Nets and um twenty nineteen twenty should be another really good season for him. Yeah, that's a great point. The contract is really nice. Obviously it's a big year for him and it's a you know, off season year, free agency year, so he's looking to even get a bigger contract than his previous one and with the way he played last year, it looks like that'll definitely be the case. Do you think there's any type of possibility he's traded this season or no? Um I, I can't see it happening unless you know, something were to happen with the Anthony Davis sort of sweepstakes. Um, I can't necessarily envision any other sort of star, you know, sort of demanding an out. Um, you know, Joe Harris is the sort of perfect complementary piece that you want in those sort of packages that can sort of make the money work. You know, him, Dinwiddie, those, that sort of money already there is about $20 million. Um, but I can't see it happening. Maybe in the off season, if, you know, if there were to be something around the Anthony Davis sweepstakes. But um, in, in the middle of the season, you know, I can't necessarily envision it uh, too highly. 
Yeah, I'd agree. I think if it were to happen, it would be in the offseason. I wouldn't say it's likely either. I would say, you know, the Nets will probably try to retain him because of what he's done in terms of the growth he's had and representing the organization and the culture the Nets are trying to build. But talking about culture, our guy Damari Carroll has helped really set the tone for the Nets since he's been in Brooklyn. What would you think of him last season? Oh, it was really, really, really important. Um, I think in some of our other guys' series, uh, I can't remember if it was Will or someone else Will, that uh, did, yep, a piece, he loves yeah, did a piece on Damari Carroll. And I, and I think that, you know, there were points throughout the season where I remember speaking and I'm like, you know, Damari Carroll is our most important player. You know, a guy who can play the three and four, that sort of tweener position, play good defense, hit a shot, um, and just so steady, you know, leadership and, and steady defense. Um, I, I thought that, you know, his importance, obviously, he had his up and down moments due to his age and occasional niggling injuries. But um, Damari Carroll had a tremendous season. And, you know, for what we've gotten from him, you know, in his, you know, age 30-ish or however old he is now. Um, let me just take a quick look. Um, yeah, he's, he's age 32 now. And, you know, he had probably, you know, one of his five best seasons as a 32-year-old for the Brooklyn Nets. You know, again, that salary dump deal that we got for him is, is paying dividends. And I think that we continue to look back on it as an incredibly favorable deal for Brooklyn. Yeah, 100%. And not only on the court and what he's done for the team to help them win games, but off the court, helping set the tone, having that previous relationship with Kenny Atkinson, it was big. And I also think... Damari, when he first came back from injury early in the year, he wasn't himself, and then he kind of started to find rhythm. And I think that helped the Nets play better basketball, you know, through the two-thirds two mark of the season when they started to go on that win streak or in January. You know, Damari started to be a bigger piece of the team. He really did. Um, you know, he just had some really, really big moments. I think that, you know, we'll probably get to these biggest moments. But for me, it was just that Cleveland game and that Cleveland shot. You know, it was yep. just... Uh, the, the absolute absolute clutch, absolute dagger, um, one of the, the highlights of the season in general. But you know, obviously, D'Angelo was huge in that overtime as well. And you know, Damari was the guy that went to him. He was like, dude, you're an all-star now. We need you to play like one. We need you to step up. Um, and you want your sort of leaders to sort of, you know, put it on your guys, put it on your younger blokes who are sort of, you know, heading up in the ranks and, and sort of, you know, force them to, you know, put up or shut up. And you know, Damari sort of, you know, didn't necessarily just do the talking. He also put up himself hitting that, Absolutely massive shot. It was just uh, one of the shots of the season. You know, I'm pretty sure that that was like one of the photos of Barclays and stuff and, you know, him getting picked up. Um, Damari Carroll, you know, not just a, a consummate player, but a consummate teammate as well. Yeah, 100%. And then you could tell by the way the team reacted when he hit that shot that everybody was there to pick him up and they're all super hyped. So obviously that was probably his biggest moment of the season. Any other moments stick out for you in terms of Damari? Yeah, I think that it, it was just so consistent and it's hard to sort of, you know, just sort of pick out, you know, just one or two in general. Um, you know, he was pretty good in the Grizzlies game as well. Um, that sort of, you know, heartbreaking sort of loss in, in late November. Um, and, and then again, you know, he was pretty good again in, against the Rockets as well um, in that sort of comeback win where he had, you know, 22 points and five rebounds and hit a heap of threes too. Uh, obviously, that was more Spencer's game, but he was... He was great there. Um, so I think yeah, there was plenty of sort of very steady, consistent performances from Damari Carroll. And, you know, it earns him plenty of kudos from, uh, from our guys at OTG, especially Will. Yeah, no, I think that Houston game sticks out. He hit some big shots, but if I'm not mistaken, he had some, like, clutch, you know, just veteran-type moments at the end of that game to help the Nets, you know, get that lead. Obviously, it was Dinwiddie's game, like you said, but he had some big moments in there as well. Then uh, during that Nets blowout against Dallas, he was pretty big. But obviously, you got to mention the outfits with him because he has major swag. True that, Swag Daddy himself. So, obviously, he's had an influence on the team in that aspect. But, Jack, since, you know, Damari's a little older, like you mentioned, he's 32. We're not going to really talk about improvements he made. But what 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 did he really bring to the team this year that helped them win games? Yeah, I think that he was just probably one of the smartest, if not the smartest player in terms of knowing how and when to read the game and what it was sort of asking for. You know, if there was a bucket that needed to be gotten, you know, Damari Carroll would just sort of draw some contact and get to the line and just see the ball go through the hoop. You know, if the offense wasn't necessarily clicking, you know, he would just be able to sort of, you know, get to the line, hit a couple of free throws and sort of get the ball moving again. Um, he was a, a quality rebounder um, in, in a really positive sort of fashion. You know, one of only four players to average five or more rebounds a game. And obviously the other two are the bigs and Rondo Hollis Jefferson was the other one. Uh, so I think I thought his rebounding was tremendous. Uh, obviously in, in terms of clutch time play, just sort of, you know, relating to that sort of general intelligence as well. And I think we'll talk about it with, 
you know, Jared Dudley as well. Um, obviously, Dwayne Carroll has a little more left in the tank than a guy like Jared Dudley does right now. But um, oh, I think that he just was able to read the game at such a level, obviously spending, you know, over a decade in this league. And um, I, I thought he provided timely defense a lot as well. Obviously, he's, his athleticism is waning, as you would expect of any sort of 32-year-old who's been around the ways um, and has had a few injuries here and there. But, you know, he just had timely shots, just timely plays on both ends of the floor. He was that savvy vet that, you know, every team needs, and especially yeah. a young team like the Nets. And his experience really showed, like you said, when the other team was on a run, you know, doing his caroling and getting to the free throw line just to stop the game, get the Nets some points. You know, defensively, he wasn't amazing because, like you mentioned, the athleticism has come down a little bit, but he still makes some heady plays in there. And you're right, the rebounding really helped the bench you. And I thought that was a big boost when he kind of came back to finding his, getting his feet under him. The rebounding he brought to the team was pretty big. And he was in for the majority of the season and, and postseason as well. He was probably the, a part of the best Nets lineups that were on the floor. You know, was it whoever it was surrounded by? Obviously, you know, the talk was, oh, you know, is D'Angelo going to finish? Is Spencer going to finish? But you would generally always have, oh, you know, it's going to be Joe Harris going to out there and Damari Carroll. Those were you sort of locked because, you know, you needed a sort of guy who can play the three or four, play a bit of defense, hit a, hit a few shots and just know how to, you know, sort of close out games um, in, in a really intelligent way. But, you know, I think Damari, you know, when we were sort of talking about, oh, who do we need to bring back into the starting lineup? You know, Damari Carroll is always sort of there. Obviously, he... It, the, his role changed throughout the season, given, you know, sort of uh, a, a few niggling injuries here and there and, you know, Rodion's going in and out. Uh, but Damari was, was incredibly consistent in, in a sort of similar way to what Joe Harris was. He's exactly what Kenny really wanted to have as a veteran on his team. Somebody he could throw out there that he could trust, that knew what he wanted as a coach. And that's kind of the role he filled for the team. And it wouldn't surprise me if he was back next year either. It depends, obviously, on the contract and, you know, his comments at uh, the, the exit interviews. But, Jack, what would be the ideal lineup for Damari? Yeah, I think with Damara, you, you need to have a, a sort of similar lineup to, to Joe Harris. You know, you have your big, you have your floor general, you have, you know, one or two shooters out there. And with him, whether it's a, a more athletically gifted sort of, you know, three, or, you know, um, I, I'd probably prefer him at the, the three and then the four. Um, I think that he sort of said that as well. Obviously, it gets a, in, in today's day and age, you know, the, the positional versatility is incredibly beneficial. But I think he'd probably be most comfortable guarding threes um, rather than fours. So whether that's, you know, a Nikola Meritage, just a guy who's probably got a few inches and, you know, 10 or 20 pounds on him in that sort of respect. I think he'd probably be more comfortable at the three position uh, in, in this part of his career. But um, as well, you know, you could probably throw him at spurts at the four and small ball lineups, which I think would be beneficial to him as well. Um, no, I think that he's still got a couple of years left in this league, whether it's on the Brooklyn Nets or somewhere else. Yeah, I think... Uh... I think it depends on the style of basketball you play because I think on some teams his best position is a four and other teams the best position, position is a three, but it really just matters who's along his side. And just in that role player type role, like you mentioned, maybe Joe being the elite spacer out there and Damari being the other guy that kind of provides a little bit of defense and a little bit of three-point shooting. So it'll be interesting to see where what happens with him this year in terms of his role, whatever team he's on next year. Yeah, you don't want him to be the, the best anything out there you don't want him to be like you know, your your, your knockdown shot maker you don't want him to be your best defender out there but he can easily be your second or third best guy um, and can guard some of the better guys out there it's not to say that he can't guard you know for for a few minutes at a time some of the better players in this league the better wings in this league but you don't want that for you know eight to eight to ten minute stretches you want it for you know to from three to six minute stretches at the, at the very most um he still has a lot to give in this league and um oh, i think that you know he's going to be suiting up somewhere um whether it's in, in brooklyn uh, like you meant like you alluded to with the sort of exit interviews and the instagram post um i, I think that he'll he's got a he's got a future um, however long it is. Which areas do you wish he was better last season other than the playoffs, which he was really bad? Um, uh, I think that there will be times where, you know, he would become a little bit lost on offense. Um, uh, and, and I think that when we sort of needed that sort of just, you know, shot make, um, he wasn't amazing from the three-point arc this season, you know, shooting only 34-ish you know, percent from, from the three-point line. Um, so, you know, he's shot... You know, thirty-seven percent last year, thirty-four percent. You know, the year before in a in a really inter in, in that season, that one of the last sort of full season for Toronto. Um, so I, I think that that number was probably the the thing that probably sticks out the most, especially in a team that really craves that three-point shooting. Um, other than that, you know, you, I, I don't think you can ask for a, a, a ridiculous amount because, like we talked about with his strengths, you know, he was such a great rebounder. He, he he's so smart and and he provides such timely plays. 
um, you know, you're not asking for, you know, a Kevin Durant level style of play. You just want a, a, a really savvy, and in terms of the veteran sort of role player, you know, Kyrie Irving in the middle of the last season was talking about, you know, we need this, you know, 32 year old sort of guy who's just been around the sort of ways. And I'm just like, hmm, we've got a guy like that. Um, and, you know, obviously they have guys like Al Horford and Aaron Baines on their team too. But, you know, Damari Carroll is is what every sort of team, you know, whether they be on the rise, um, whether they be, you know, fighting for a playoff team and can add sort of, you know, just depth to the rotation. Um, you know, he would play on probably every team in the league. You know, you look at the Toronto Raptors right now, obviously he's a former Raptor. He might struggle to fight in their rotation. And, and I think... <laughs> probably he would be fine in the Warriors. I think he would probably, you know, usurp a lot of their players. You know, guys like Sean Livingston, Jonas Repko, these sort of guys, Alfonso McKinney, to maybe a lesser extent. Um, you know, he has, you know, a role on probably most teams in this league. So the fact that we're saying that, you know, there aren't many things you can sort of nitpick at. Yeah, I think you would just probably want to be a tad more efficient. Like you mentioned, three-point shooting field goal percentage, pick that up a little bit. You know, watch out with the turnovers. He really doesn't do that a lot. But you're right. He does have a role on almost any team in the league because he can play that 3-4 spot, and he does a lot of things, you know, solid to pretty good. You know, he's not amazing, like you mentioned, at really anything, but he does a lot of things. He fills a lot of roles, and coaches like the way he plays because he understands what you need him to do out there. Yeah, I mean, I think that the sort of word utility gets thrown around yep. almost as like a, a negative sort of thing. But, you know, in that sort of aspect, you know, you can talk like as Joe Harris says, like a utility. These sort of like guys who can just do some things and you know aren't going to do a lot of bad things, um, which I think is um, something that you want to need in, in this sort of league, especially like, you know, if you're a young growing roster, you're going to see a lot of mistakes and you, you want to sort of, those mistakes to be made, to be made because that's where you can see guys sort of learn. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you are a Damari Carroll, he doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Um, I think that there's times where, you know, obviously, you know, he's human and you know, all basketball players make mistakes no matter who they are. Um, but if you were to chuck him on, like, you know, on a former team like in Atlanta right now, um, you know, he's that sort of perfect sort of complementary piece, and he sort of would play a very similar role into what he played on Brooklyn this season. I think that. You know, there'll be there'll be plenty of teams, you know, that'll probably be after his services. You know, obviously, you know, he's not the big name free agent on the market, but you know, there's going to be teams that you know in the most um, sought after position in the league, that sort of three, four tweener position, which was obviously you know an almost dead position back in you know the early 2000s and stuff. Now it's almost the most valuable position in the league. Yeah, I you know, I agree. I think a lot of teams, especially the ones that are kind of capped out or don't have a ton of money to spend, to look for Damari just to give them that minor upgrade to their bench. And talking about that, where does he rank at his position? You know, obviously he's not, you know, one of the top guys anymore. So we can kind of look at it as role players or as a role player or as a bench player. Where would he be in your rotation? Yeah, I think that in terms of, you know, a, an eight-man rotation, you know, I think that he's probably, you know, six or seven. And that depends on obviously how strong your upper echelon rotation is and how high your, high, high your talent is at that sort of peak. Um, you know, we spoke a little bit about the Golden State Warriors and the fact that, you know, Tobari would be that sort of perfect sort of complementary piece off the bench that they just need a guy who can come in and do some stuff. You know, you look at sort of Norman Powell, what he does with the Toronto Raptors, obviously has a little more athleticism, is hitting shots a little bit more. Uh, but on any team, you know, he'd be that perfect guy off the bench who you want to play, you know, 20 to, to 26 minutes a night. And, you know, he could probably play a, a few minutes more. Um, obviously, you know, there were times throughout the season where he was forced to do that because he was just so important to what the team was doing in terms of providing leadership and in terms of providing, you know, hitting the bucket and providing some time with defense. Um, in terms of that sort of bench presence, I think he's one of the better guys in terms of bench wings in this league. Um, you know, obviously, it's not the most glorious position um but you know not every player is going to get you know the max contract and you, know, you need to fill out those rosters in a, in a certain aspect and i think tamari carroll for what he does and for what he is um like we sort of you know harped on quite consistently will be valuable to any team on the roster and you know it depends on obviously the market dictates what you're worth and you know obviously if, if team a lot of teams strike out like you said nick you know there could be teams offering him you know whatever money it is obviously this will probably be his last sort of longish long-term-ish deal if that's what he is after if that's what he is valuing um you know whatever it is on, on the market he he has a role to play in, in today's nba um he's not you know in the sort of twilight in, in the same sort of vein that jared dudley is i think that you know he's still got probably two decent-ish seasons in him 
Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, this year he'll probably take a little bit of a drop and then the following season a little bit of a drop, but there'll still be playable seasons where he'll be serviceable. He'll probably start, you know, this contract being, you know, a seventh man your rotation, maybe eighth, and then as it kind of progresses by the end of the contract, maybe ninth man your rotation type of thing because he is getting up there in age, and like you mentioned, he has had injuries, you know, every single season. He did get the Nets performance t- uh, staff a lot of credit for keeping him healthy most of the time, and like you said, he does have a role because he's just serviceable at a lot of different things, but any thoughts else on Damari Carroll, Jack? No, I just thought that, you know, he's been such an important piece, you know, when we were doing our season review of him last year. You know, there aren't many bad things that we can say about Damari Carroll. What do you think uh, percent-wise is he back or, like, what would you put it at? Um, I'd put it at a 45% chance. I'm, I'm pretty high on it. Like, I'm not it's hard to sort of gauge because you know there's so much talk around you know Nets free agency in general around about other things and obviously you know we sort of read into Demario's comments and the fact that you know it sort of seemed like he was less of a priority but I think the team would love to have him um you know I could even say anywhere from like 40 to 70 percent it's it's hard to sort of gauge it right now because there's so much talk in the air about Kyrie Irving and, and all the other sort of guys um that I'm, it's hard to sort of fixate on you know what the number would be for Damari until you know um what the other sort of higher priority bigger fish um entail yeah I, I would probably be a little bit lower I'm thinking more 33 percent I think it's like a one in three chance you know there's a chance he might just want to stay with the Nets it's easier for his family he's been here but hey he might want to get a bigger contract with another team or maybe hop on a team that has you know higher championship you know, they're closer to winning a championship to the Nets if they don't sign a big fish. You know what I mean? One of those top seeds. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, talking about another vet who had a major impact on his first year with the Nets, and that's Ed Davis. What did you think about the season he had, the rebounding uh, machine? Yeah, he, the dude just, like, gobbles up rebounds like it's no one else's business. He is just an absolute force on the boards. Um, you know, he had 10 games where he had 10 to 19 points. Um, he had... You know, games where, you know, he had 15 to 19 rebounds six times, despite playing, <laughs> you know, a, a paltry, like, you know, barely like 20 minutes a night on, on a lot of occasions. He's like, per 36 numbers, when I get to his strengths, are just ridiculous. Um, and I think that he he helped, despite the fact that a lot of people probably won't give him credit, he helped Jared Allen in a lot of, lot of ways. And I, I think he showed him... Not only in just obviously being a presence there and, you know, being able to communicate with a guy who um, knows how to rebound probably almost better than any other guy in the league, but also just setting the example for the, you know, how to show that physicality, how to set those screens, you know, how to roll, how to show a little bit of toughness um, when it's needed. Um, he had such a great season and was, you know, people were talking him up as the best free agent signing that the Brooklyn Nets have had um, ever. And, you know, on the deal that he was, he was got on, um, we were salivating at the prospect and you know obviously a lot of Portland Trailblazers fans and and, and teammates were so um distraught to sort of lose him and um he had such an uh, amazing season and uh, that game one of the playoffs was probably you know my favorite moment yeah I agree I think game one in the playoffs was a big moment for him I think it's just a consistency along the entire season he had a couple really big uh dunks on players or just going out there and snatching the rebounds and you know we were excited when they signed him in the offseason but he killed those expectations I don't think I couldn't imagine him having the season he had for the Nets he was just a perfect backup big and like you said he helped Jared Allen on the court he also helped him off the court by setting the example and kind of giving him a different mentality you know you heard a lot of quotes from him encouraging Jared Allen and trying to give him confidence yeah, and I, and I think that that's what you sort of need and from, you know, a guy who has done this around the league, has played in playoff games and has played with some of the, the, the best players in the league and, and guys like CJ McCollum and, and Damian Lillard, to sort of get that confidence, to get that knowledge from a guy like him, it, it's invaluable. A hundred percent. And hopefully, you know, if he's not even back next season, Jared Allen can kind of take some of those things and turn it into his game a little bit more. But we mentioned biggest moments, so we'll kind of go on from there. I guess what would be the ideal lineup for an Ed Davis? Yeah, obviously, you know, Ed Davis has no real, you know, offensive game to sort of spread out to the perimeter. You know, he doesn't really have a jumper. Um, So you want sort of guys who can hang out on the perimeter to sort of give him that space on the inside and feast. Um, And he's such a, a, a really physical screener gives his guys like a lot of open looks and gives him guys those little bits of open space. Um, so I think that, you know, you want the, as much shooting as possible. And then obviously, you know, you want a, a, a DMs, a Russell, Kyrie Irving sort of type, you know, Kyrie Irving with Ed, Ed Davis in the pick and roll would be pretty sweet. Um, 
But yeah, I think that those sort of guys, you know, being a big, you know, we sort of spoke about Jared Allen a little bit. Obviously, he's looking to to grow a, a three point shot and has a little bit more lateral mobility and a bit more athleticism. Whereas Ed Davis is just sort of older archetype who can sort of, you know, grit and grind down low, really sort of feast on the boards and such. So, um, but at the same time, you know, they still would benefit off similar lineups. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, you're looking at Ed because he can't finish the same way Jared Allen can. He really needs the other three guys to be good shooters and the one, you know, elite playmaker. If it was a Kyrie Irving, somebody who could force the double team because they can knock down the mid-range shot. And then Ed Davis ends up in front of the rim with an easy layup or easy dunk. You know, that's an ideal scenario for him offensively. Yeah, you know that, you know, whoever's misses, it's almost like you're expecting Ed Davis. It's not just the fact that he's he's physical and he's big, but... You know, he just knows how to read the angles. And I think that as any sort of rebound, offensive or defensive, uh, to be able to read the ball and, and the trajectory and knowing your teammates and how they shoot um, as well and, and just the, the the different sort of angles and geometry of that is is a really intelligent thing. And, and not a lot of players have that sort of skill. And I think that, yes, you know, offensive rebounding is probably going to the wayside in today's modern NBA, but... You know, uh, I think that timely buckets in, in, in the playoff games and, you know, providing that sort of energy um, in, in, in a really tangible way is something that Ed Davis did for, for such a very long period this season. Yeah, and it's something that's really crucial if your team's going through a cold stretch. You know, you have somebody down there can grab an offensive rebound, get an easy put back, and get you those two points or four points, whatever it may be, to kind of prevent that run from extending a little bit longer for the opposing team. Yeah, definitely. Now, Jack, obviously we talked about what he brought to the team a little bit. You know, the rebounding was huge, but he did bring some other team, other things to the team that probably doesn't give it, get enough credit for. Yeah, I mean, just touching on that rebounding in terms of statistically, despite being a bench guy, he still finished 17th in total rebounds. He averaged, per 36 minutes, 17.3 rebounds per 36 minutes. Like, I saw that number and I was just like, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. 17. He really grabs every. It's like feels like he grabs every rebound. Yeah, I know. Like if there's just a shot up, yeah, it, he's out for like you know 36 minutes. Like a, a rebound every two minutes essentially is what Ed Davis would get. It, it's bewildering. Um, and I think defensively as well, he's probably you know it, uh, we we sort of had the argument. I know Will was sort of fretting over it as well. You know who is our best defensive player? Is it Ed? Is it Jared? Who's our defensive player of the year? Um, you could certainly make a a, a very good case for Ed Davis just purely because of the fact. Um, you know, he had one of the best defensive ratings on the team. Um, he just impacted in that department on such a positive way. Um, his defensive rebounding is tremendous. Um, and I think as well, you know, the other thing that I sort of touched on a little bit is just his screening. Um, I, I would love to sort of, you know, go into some really deep sort of st statistics in terms of like screen to assist ratio. I think that he would certainly be up there. And in terms of guys around the league, and in, in terms of guards and stuff, you, know, you don't want to walk into an Ed Davis room because the guy is just big, solid, and he's strong. Yeah, I think that's just pretty much other than the rebounding. It's just Ed Davis does a lot of small things that helps your team win games. Setting good screens on and off ball really just gets space for the offense, especially if guys are having trouble separating. Having somebody out there who can literally set a brick wall up is big for a team, especially with the offense the Nets run. And then defensively, we talked about it a little bit, like you mentioned, he's not you know an elite athlete, but he's a very smart defender when it comes to rotation, using his strength and using his body and you know using that verticality. Yeah, and he's decent, decent enough in the post. Obviously, you know, playing against one of the best defend, but best big men in the league, in, in Joel Embiid, he was probably our best defender on him when he was healthy. Obviously, that wasn't for very long; it was for about a game or so. Um, do, you so obviously the, do you think the Nets win another game in the Philly series if Ed Davis is healthy for the rest of the series? Yeah, I would say that. I, I would say, that. but then you could easily put the the shoe on the other foot in the in the sense that if Joel Embiid was healthy, but you know, I think it's a lot easier to say it with Ed Davis because. You know, Ed Davis is pretty consistently healthy, whereas Joel Embiid is just not a healthy player. Um, if you're summing True. him up and, um, you know, 60% of his career, he's not necessarily healthy. Obviously, he's gotten better um, with age and he showed some some, some signs um, in this postseason. But, you know, if you're talking about, you know, just a one-game sample size or, or a one-series sample size, you, know, you can't expect Joel Embiid to be healthy because it's just not going to happen. Whereas most of the time, you would expect Ed Davis to be healthy. So, yeah, maybe that does get the, the Nets another game. Uh, but at the same time, maybe that just, you know, makes, you know, Joel Embiid a little bit angry and, and post an, an Ed Davis Instagram post or something on Twitter and to fire himself up.
Yeah, I agree. I think obviously you make the case Embiid's healthy, but I also thought he did a, a lot better job on Embiid than obviously uh, Jared Allen did, and a lot of that has to do with size. So, But it would have been interesting to see him play for the entire playoffs and give Kenny a vet instead of kind of just throwing a Jared Allen out there to the Wolves. Then also I thought Boban had a pretty big impact, for, so just having another big out there would have been huge. But what would you have liked to see better from uh, Ed Davis last year? I think the one thing, um, Nick, obviously we, we are, there's so many things he does well. The the literally one thing that sticks out is just that he fouls a lot. Um, yeah. He ranked 18th in the league in total fouls, and, um, <laughs> which is a lot for a guy who comes off the bench. You know, obviously, you know, he was 17th in the league in total rebounds. But conversely, um, it's not necessarily that he, I think that because of his role, you know, you sort of just want that toughness, that physicality. And, you know, Kenny's not necessarily going to be like, look, we don't care if you foul out. And he did foul out, you know, a couple of times. So I think being able to be, a, you know, a little bit smarter with his physicality in that sort of sense, that wouldn't have necessarily changed his season trajectory. And um, I, I think that, you know, fouling, you know, you know, you look at a guy like Zach Collins as well. That's one area that worked for him. It's more of just, you know, an immaturity level, just not knowing how to play NBA defense yet. Whereas Ed Davis is just, you know, just too physical. And and sometimes you, you give him, you know, you've got six fouls, you're going to play in 25 minutes, give him away, Ed. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's a lot of fouls. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is definitely a lot of fouls, and sometimes they're meaningless fouls. I think the ones you don't mind if someone's attacking the rim and you just doesn't want to give them an easy layup, that's fine. But some of them were kind of a little bit outside towards the perimeter and just a little extra physicality that's not necessary in that specific situation. Then obviously I think his entire career coaches have probably wished that he could just finish a little bit better inside in terms of just expanding out like one or two feet because sometimes when he's not right next to the rim, he can't hit. Yeah, I think that that sort of those moves down low are a little bit limited in terms of his offensive gifts, um, and you obviously want him to stretch it out a little bit. But for for what he provides you in, in the limited sort of role that is asked, um, uh, I think that he he does absolutely plenty. Yeah, for his role, he knows what he needs to do. Now, in terms of where he ranks at his position, I'd probably say you know one of the top five backup centers in the league, top three. Yeah, I would have said top three. Um, it depends on you know who you're ranking him against. I think that's it's hard to sort of think of guys that sort of immediately spring to mind as being like quality bigs off the bench. You know, maybe guys at like Nerlens Noel. Um, I can't necessarily think of guys. You know, in, it's in interesting the- because a lot of teams don't necessarily always play a center no. off the bench. So it's like okay, I'm not really sure because the Nets were one team that really you know played their center a decent amount. Yeah, and then and, and most guys will play like their center, you know, 35 minutes and, you know, the other sort of big will play, you know, to 10 to sort of 15 minutes, if that. So um, I think that, you know, Ed Davis is one of the best sort of big men off the bench. You know, Enos Cantor, um, you know, was generally a bench sort of guy for most of the season. You know, he does, he has a different sort of skill set in terms of obviously he's an amazing rebounder as well, but it has a tremendous offensive game, whereas Ed Davis is a little bit better defensively. Um, so I think that Ed Davis, you know, for, for what he is on right now, you know, in, in a similar vein to what Damari Carroll is, he's still got, I think he has an even longer role in this league because obviously less is asked of him because, you know, he has such a narrow skill set, but not a narrow skill set in a negative sense, but because, you know, you're a center, so you don't need to necessarily do uh, a heat more. And obviously, you know, in the playoffs, obviously, we, we sort of see that, you know, the center position always gets played off the floor, but uh, against the sort of bigs like, you know, Nicole Jokic, Joel Embiid, you know, you're going to need uh, a quality center and a, and a quality backup at that as well because, these two guys are, could be running the league for a long time, and Carl Anthony Towns is on the rise too. Um, the big man position, despite the fact that you know right now we're seeing two teams, you know, combating against each other, who have some of the best Peruna players that we've ever seen. Um, oh, I think that the, the teams that are on the next sort of wave, um, the big man position is where it's at. Yeah, and I think you look at Ed Davis, you mentioned his career carrying on, and I think just having that size and be able to know how to use it will help him, especially defensively and on the boards. You know, you always have room for a big like that. And the center position, even though they don't play a ton, a lot of teams carry three centers, so it'll kind of help expand his career a little bit more. Talking about his career, where does he end up this offseason? Same thing with Damari, where the percentage at for Ed Davis? Um, I think the percentage is a little bit lower for me, probably closer to your 33% right? just because I think that there will be teams that will want him. Um, and yeah. I think there'll be teams that'll give him a little bit more money. Um, it was sort of like a, a one year sort of make good deal, um, so to speak, because, you know, he sort of proved himself. Um, you know, the Nets could do worse than resign him to some sort of, you know, cost friendly deal um, that doesn't necessarily, you know, throw away any sort of flexibility and such. Uh, but I think that there will be some teams, you know, you know, he could even head back to Portland. You know, there, there could be some things that happen that are in flux over there. 
Um, but I think that Ed Davis has proven himself to be a quality big and a guy that you can play against some of the best bigs in this league. And I think, you know, for a lot of teams that are, you know, in conferences uh, and, and in divisions where they will come up against, you know, like guys that I mentioned, Nicole Jokic, Carl Anthony Towns, you know, Chris Atspozingas is going to be back next season. You know, the big position is, is an incredibly stacked and uh, incredibly talented one right now. And I think Ed Davis is a guy you can combat and, and a guy that, you know, if you want to get some rebounds and you want to improve your rebounding, you add in Ed Davis, it automatically makes you a, uh, you know, a five to ten, maybe not ten spot, but a five spot better rebounding team through him alone. Yeah, I think he's a great fit on a team that already has a lot of great off, you know, talent. And he's that, you know, fifth starter, or if he's a guy that's coming off the bench and being a guy that doesn't really, you don't really ask him to do much except his role. And I agree, I think he'll get, you know, more money than the Nets are probably wanting to offer, depending on what happens with other free agents. So I'd probably put him at 25%, maybe even 15%, because I think last year was just such a steal. And it's kind of like, no, he obviously wasn't as good as Brooke Lopez, but it's like the same situation with the Bucks. They got Brooke Lopez for that cheap deal for one year. Obviously, that's not going to happen again. No, exactly. Lightning um, certainly doesn't strike twice. Now, Jack, any other thoughts on Ed Davis, Damari, Joe Harris? I'm not going to let you talk about him anymore, but anything on Ed? <laughs> um, I think that, you know, we'll look back on this season with Ed Davis with, with some really, really fond memories. And, you know, for, from times where it was just like, you know, you wanted a, a bucket and, you know, we sort of talked about, you know, Joe Harris providing a timely bucket in terms of a three-point or whatever. If Ed Davis was out there, it's just like, let me just get an offensive rebound and, and a put back here. Um, he did that time and time and time and time and time again, just doing recaps for Nets Republic and you know, talking to you on, on the Brooklyn Buzz in, in post games. It would feel like I would always have like a million notes about Ed Davis put back, Ed Davis offensive rebound put back. And um, it, it's a memory that I'll, I'll hold pretty dear for, from the 2018-19 season. Yeah, it's the ability of turning a bad offensive possession into a, you know, a two points. And that's something Ed Davis can do for you. And I feel like you said, you know, he played with the Nets, which possibly one season, but we're all Ed Davis fans, you know, for the rest of our lives. That's it. That's it. All right, Jack, anything else before we get out of here? No, nah, just uh, there'll be plenty of more of these guys. Obviously, we still have to get through a couple more and I'm um, looking forward to, to smashing out the, the rest of the Nets roster. Yes, and also just quick shout out to Design Tree slash Off the Glass. We got Brooklyn Buzz tees. We're also adding some tees for the finals. We just dropped the Kawhi one, the Cyborg, so check that out. And it's always a pleasure, Jack. And check us out iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, GBasketball.com, that's a public.com, Dash Radio, and YouTube. DSGNTree.com.